right? And where there is something to learn, where there is an error. So a series of errors. So that reading process is something that I have cherished. And it'll be a cold day in hell that I will get my reading from an electronic uh, <laughs> computer screen or whatever electronic mechanism they have. But then I'm not long for this world, so I don't have to worry too much about those problems. No, I read very carefully when I do read. We're into a generation of children now who are the children of parents who grew up under television. Uh, you being a person who was raised in a book culture, what do you think the impact of television has had, not only on the first TV generation, but now the generation that's coming up that have parents? who were raised under the TV generation? It could very well be catastrophic. Very well be catastrophic. And not only looking at television programs that I <coughs> have encountered when I do some TV surf surfing, I do that once in a while to find out if there's, when I, if there's anything interesting, particularly on the Learning Channel and uh, certain excellent movie channels like Bravo and uh, public television. These are my principal uh, nourishment from TV. But um, when I look at the horror that is presented there, I'm not only astonished by the extent to which this brutalizes people. I mean, there's so much ketchup being used in uh, so-called uh, detective stories that people don't realize what they do when they press a trigger or they plunge a knife. And there is so much screaming going on and mayhem and monst monstrosities that appear. And at the same time, there's such glib stuff that is virtually on the cartoon level in which there's no uh, attempt to go into anything beyond the most narrowest dimensions, uh, simplest dimensions of a particular work or a novel. How can anyone put War and Peace on the screen? <laughs> Tolstoy's War and Peace. I've seen four movies and with a great deep sense of disgust, including a Russian attempt, which was far more serious than anything else, and make Henry Fonda Pierre when he was a great big bulky guy, and whose bulk was very important in shaping him up, uh, and make uh, somebody else Prince uh, Andre, and this one, and that one, and that one, and that one, and, and lose the whole thematic material and the richness. The description that Tolstoy evokes in his novel is so far beyond the capacity of a picture. A picture is not a thousand words, believe me. There can be a thousand words that are far more than 10,000 pictures. Okay? So that troubles me immensely. What also troubles me is the way in which information is conveyed. And I'm just speaking of information. I'm not even asking for wisdom. Look at headline news once in a while. And you get less than I get in the Burlington Free Press, which is a local newspaper. Far less. You know, and uh, that's another way in which... But the mind is especially poisoned by the extent to which reality is presented to you in such a tailored way, even its horrors, that you immunize yourself to experience, to real-life experience. You have to break away from the TV stranglehold and even from the communication highway stranglehold, so to speak, to experience something... And especially when those experiences, as many Americans uh, uh, engage in, come to you from television. Six hours a day is regarded as fairly normative. There's also the tendency, even with the keyboard on a computer. I use computers because they are useful to me. But that comes from a long history of having written with a pen in hand. Only a year ago, I was writing with a ballpoint pen and a yellow pad, and then I used an electric typewriter. When I went on to the uh, a computer, I did that already steeply schooled for the greater part of 70 years, you know, <laughs> in writing and thinking out my thoughts. And, and that, has, that makes all the difference in the world. But when a child starts out immediately with a computer and then after moves toward diagrams and pictures and Images instead of words, and I repeat, images are not better than a thousand words. Uh, then I become very disturbed by the kind of mentality that begins to appear. 
it's superficial. It's, it has no, it is not in a mentality that's engaged in struggle. The pain, as Hegel put it, of the dialectic. I mean, to struggle one's way through ideas, that was the reason why I would never take LSD in the 60s. I was told that it would blow my mind. I said, no, I spent years and decades trying to build my mind. I don't want to blow it. I mean, maybe you haven't done that, and if you feel the best thing you can do is fire, metaphorically speaking, shotgun pellets into your mind, that's up to you. No, I treasure my mind. I worked at building my mind. I'm not going to go for a quick fix. And TV and much of this computer technology, if not used wisely, turns into a quick, quick fix. But let me stress all the time, whenever we are talking about these things, we're not talking about autonomous things. I mean, I'm not going to claim that all technology is neutral. Nuclear uh, power stations are not neutral. They absolutely must be abolished. There are many things I can also think of that I'd like to see abolished. It includes the whole arsenal of weaponry that we have in the world today. Uh, there are many things I don't like to see moving as quickly as they do, such as certain airplanes that are so on and so forth, that are going to quickly shoot me from one place to another. Again, I repeat, these may be useful as ambulances, <laughs> you know, when you have to get to the doctor real fast because it's a matter of life and death, when the message has to get out real fast because it's important news that has to be conveyed. I'm not talking about that. So there are many technologies that I find myself at most, I mean, quite often resistant against, and there are other technologies that I think should be used sparingly and appropriately. But remember that all these technologies are not autonomous. They don't give you a technocratic mind. Why shouldn't I have a technocratic mind? I lived in a city all my life, which made me love the country. All the more. I assure you, if I'd been raised in the country, as I know many people were, and as I know many people since I live now in a very rural environment do want to, they want to get out. They want to get to the city. No, I can appreciate the country all the better. And Max Horkheimer, in a book called The Eclipse of Reason, very appropriately has said some of the greatest defenders of so-called wild nature, and I don't believe that wild nature really exists. I think we have so altered the planet as a species for more than two million years, beginning with the discovery of the uses of fire, and that goes way back about two million years ago to Homo erectus. We've been changing this planet repeatedly. But the point that I want to get to is that technology is really a function overwhelmingly of society. It's overwhelmingly a function of society. It's overwhelmingly conditioned by the society in which we live. And the tendency to be anti-technological is also to be, is also in effect to be anti-democratic in a strange way, in as much as, as I pointed out, without a technology that will give people the free time to cultivate themselves and to be political people participating in the political process, free of labor, onerous labor, and free to be creative, too, with their hands, not only with their minds, is producing a disaster right now. We're blaming on technology what should be blamed on the marketplace. <laughs> We're blaming on reason what should be blamed on the capitalist system of accumulation and production. We're blaming on... Uh, on uh, on uh, history, which should be placed on the shoulders of hierarchies and classes that emerged in history. And we don't see how the two intertwine with each other. And in the quick fix moment right now, when hot dogs are to be preferred to a real meal, or hamburgers, or McDonald's, or a quick run through history of Disneyland has its way out in the Manassas battlefield, in the absence thereof, it's very easy to pick up technology, reason, civilization, progress, and damn it. And the bourgeoisie loves you for doing it. Because <laughs> they are something very new in history. Throughout this discussion, you've been using some terminology such as left, anarchism, communism, libertarianism, and uh, I think most people uh, hearing those terms f immediately feel alienated uh, because I think they lack an understanding of the terminology. 
could you go into uh, these words and do you think do you think these words should be used or should they be avoided in uh, discussions I think they should be used and I think they should be explained because when words become mere buzzwords and people are no longer thinking they're responding viscerally without thinking the word left should be used for the reasons that I've explained over all this past hour and a half I think the word anarchism is very ecumenical like the word socialism like the word I don't know religion <laughs> there are people who are anarchists who call themselves anarchists whom I disagree with more than I disagree with Marxists they're individualists and the idea basically that our ta anarchism is incompatible with uh, democracy is in my opinion repulsive because these are people who don't believe in any institutions, so consequently they think that dem democracy is the rule of the majority over the minority, as though the minority under in an anarchist society would not have all the freedom in the world to change the, the viewpoint of the majority. But they hear the word rule, so that makes them weep. Okay? They hear the word rule, and that doesn't. <laughs> and they say, democracy is incompatible with anarchism. What is compatible with anarchism? A temporary autonomous zone? A good high? If that's what it is, then I'm not an anarchist. I remain a socialist. Anarchism is a part of socialism. Socialism is to me a really part of anarchism. But you can't keep people from calling themselves anarchists. I call them anarchoids, you know, like hominoids and stalinoids and whatever you have. And a lot of them, by the way, recently, who forgot to call themselves anarchists, eschewed the word. Fifth Estate was opposed to being called an anarchist periodical. And it is against civilization, it's against technology, God knows what it's against anymore. I don't know who's speaking what, when, and where in that, that periodical. Uh, anarchy, the journal Desire Armed, Desire Armed, you get the situationist nuance over there? Desire Armed. As though arming desire is going to change the world. I'm sorry, it's going to take more with arms to change the world than your desire to self-express yourself, to engage in self-expression. Okay, I disagree with these people, very fundamentally. Just because they're against the state doesn't mean a thing to me. That is not enough. So are, so are many capitalists. They're against state intervention. Now, the word libertarian was invented by the French anarchists because the word anarchist was illegal in the 1890s. So I think it was Elisee Reclus, but I'm not sure, invented the word libertarian, uh, libertaire which has now been picked up by the free marketeers, another big joke, who call themselves anarcho libertarian anarchists. <laughs> and so this wordplay now goes, gets entirely confused, and it's very important to unscramble it. Because libertarianism, they should call themselves what they really are, and I have nothing against them calling themselves what they really are, proprietarians, and that's the end of it. Same thing with the word socialist. The word socialist now is used so ecumenically that it becomes ridiculous when a market socialist which is to say a socialist who believes in the market, which is to say a socialist who has not examined the logic of the market to colonize everything that isn't the market. Bring in the market, you might as well give somebody a little bit of cancer. <laughs> or they die just a little bit. That's absurd. You can't, you're either dead, you may be dying, but you can't be a little dead. <laughs> Unless it's up here sometimes, and I've seen that. So if you're going to bring in the market, you're, you're bringing in a little bit of death into socialism or a little bit of cancer into socialism, which is, in my opinion, ridiculous. A very important misuse of words that I would like to add to all the points that you have raised is the use of hierarchy. Hierarchy is the relationship between people. It's not a relationship between everything in the world in relationship to everything in the world. Even a chain of being, which works with the supposition of blue-green algae are at the bottom of the chain, and human beings are up at the top of the chain, is not a hierarchy. Nobody's oppressing blue-green algae. <laughs> Nobody is dominating blue-green algae. If you were doing it, and I can't think of how you would do it unless it meant 